Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone to our second week of our Understanding Deep Learning Seminar Series. That's an event organized by Data, a student group from the University of Sao Paulo here in Brazil. We are very happy to have Dr. Ying Chen Li today with us. She's currently a lecturer in the Department of, Computer, of Computing at the Imperial College London. Before that, she spent two years, two and a half years as a senior researcher at Microsoft Research Cambridge. She completed her PhD thesis on approximate inference at the University of Cambridge. And her current research interests include deep probabilistic graphical design, fast and accurate Bayesian inference and computation, uncertainty quantification for computation and down downstream tasks, robust and adaptive machine learning systems. Today, she'll talk to us about Gaussian processes and we wish everybody a very good talk. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. So uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay, I hope you can see my screen right now. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So yes, so thanks for uh, having me here um, in your understanding uh, deep learning um, seminar series. So I understand from the organizers that um, uh, you will have one introductory lecture and also an, another advanced uh, lecture. So um, today I'm going to give you an introduction to uh, Gaussian processes. And I understand on Friday you will be hearing about things related to neural networks and Gaussian processes. So um, I think um, maybe it's good to basically, you know, we start from parametric models like linear uh, regression or non-linear regression models and then see how we can you know um, use the corner tricks to make them into Gaussian processes so um, yeah so let's begin so um, just to say one more thing so uh, if you want to know more about Gaussian processes um, there is a very nice series of summer school uh, called Gaussian process summer school that you can uh, look at so uh, this has been run for quite some quite some time and I think uh, based all of the videos from previous year's lectures, they are all online. So um, if you want to get a more, say, um, thorough understanding of Gaussian processes, including many of the uh, computation and approximation techniques there, then I really recommend you to check out uh, videos on this um, website. And part of the talk uh, today is adapted from my uh, lecture in this summer school. So just to give you an idea what we are going to talk about today. So we are going to start from the very simple um, machine learning model called the linear regression and then see how we can, you know, uh, extend linear regression to the nonlinear cases and then apply kernel methods uh, to do regression. So after that, we will have a, a little break on uh, Q&A and then we will go through uh, the rest of the two topics to see how you can actually, you know, uh, relate a uh, neural network to a Gaussian processes and the other way around. Okay, so um, I apologize that today it will be a bit in intense in terms of, um, say, uh, the, the technical details, but I think this will be very helpful for you to, you know, uh, set up the basis and try help you to understand Friday's lecture. So let's start from uh, linear regression. So essentially, um, you will have a data, data set like this with, you know, a uh, lot of uh, observation in these blue dots. And the idea here is you assume, if you assume this data point ha uh, it has some sort of linear behavior, then what we want to do is we want to feed a linear regression model on the data. So just to set up the notation, so you will have the input as x vectors and also the output. And here we, uh, for the simplicity sake, we just consider the one dimension uh, output. And here, if you have n data points, then you will have a uh, n dimensional vector as the uh, uh, y vector. So the goal here, as we said, for linear regression is to find this uh, sort of like slope or slope parameter theta such that um, you can uh, compute the output y that is approximately equal to uh, the input x times the uh, slope, slope parameter theta. Okay, um, so just to uh, make it a little bit more concrete, as I said, you have an input uh, as a vector and output as a scalar. And then um, in linear regression, we assume that the output and the input are, are 
uh, linearly dependent. So that means you can basically compute the inner product between uh, the input and also the uh, uh, parameter theta, and then maybe you assume the output is also noisy. So you assume this has Gaussian noise. So this is your model assumption on how the observation Y is generated. So this corresponds to a, a probabilistic model assumes the distribution of Y given the input X and the parameter is a Gaussian distribution with mean defined by the inner product of X and theta and variance as the variance of your Gaussian noise. Okay. So yeah, theta is the ground model parameter we want to fit, and sigma square is the output variance. And also in particular, um, in many cases, we want to set a, a prior distribution on the uh, parameter theta. So this may be the case, for example, if you have prior knowledge on that. But in linear regression, in many cases, we don't actually want the uh, theta to have uh, to, to have very big norm. Otherwise, theta will have very big magnitudes. So, um, we may want to put a Gaussian prior with zero mean and some variance on the uh, model parameter theta. Okay, so now let's see how do we actually fit the um, um, model parameter. So um, there is an estimation technique called maximum a posteriori or MAP fitting, which means uh, you want to uh, obtain the best parameter theta by maximizing the log join distribution of uh, the output Y and the model parameter theta. So the join distribution factorizes into the uh, likelihood terms and also the prior terms. So don't worry if you don't understand what is this, you will see uh, in a second uh, how uh, this will turn out to be something that you might be a bit more familiar. Okay, so um, to see how do we actually rewrite this equation. So we first need to assume that we make a conditional I the assumption on data, which basically means that, you know, um, given the um, parameter theta and the input X, each of the output variable y, yn and ym, they are independent. So in other words, you know, uh, um, the current input does not uh, in interact with the, uh, say, the other input in terms of like um, producing the output y. So that's conditional independence. And then remember in the previous slide that we said um, this is a linear regression model and y is the uh, a linear regression uh, prediction plus some Gaussian noise. And this is reflected by uh, the assumption of the P of Y given X. So this is just uh, to write down the Gaussian distribution. And you, if you collect all the terms into matrices and vectors, and this will become the L2 error um, between the uh, observed data Y and the prediction comes from uh, the model, the linear model. Okay. so. Again, um, for the second term, we assume we have a Gaussian prior with mean zero and uh, some precision lambda. And uh, basically, it tells you that the log prior is essentially the um, L2 norm of uh, theta uh, scaled up by some constant. So there you have it. If you plug in this definition here, then you get uh, to uh, this um, objective function that you might be a bit more familiar. So just talk uh, uh, through the objective function here. So the, this first term you can see as a reconstruction error. And here, because we use the Gaussian assumption uh, of the output given condition on the input, here the reconstruction error is measured by the uh, square error. OK, so that's the first term, reconstruction error. And the second term here you can see is kind of like a regularizer, a L2 non-regularizer. And the L2 uh, non-regularizer comes from the fact that we choose um, um, the prior to be Gaussian. If we choose the prior to be something else like Laplace distribution, then it will be, for example, like the L1 regularizer. And this uh, uh, will turn to, into something called Lasso uh, regression that some of you might have heard before. OK, so yeah, so this is the objective function that we are trying to uh, minimize to obtain the slope parameter for a linear regression model. So let's see how this um, you know, um, optimization can be done. So essentially, if we want to obtain the uh, best 
best parameters, then what we want is essentially we want to uh, find out the parameters such that the, the gradient of the uh, loss function with respect to the parameter is zero. So yes, yeah, so as simple as that. So let's just do that. So we can basically write down the gradient of this entire loss function with respect to theta, which turns out to be this term. So um, and if you set it to zero, then you need to solve this equation and you know, by manipulating uh, the algebra and do the computation yourself, um, you can essentially figure out that the optimal solution of the slope parameter uh, theta star uh, is provided by this term. So you, you can see there are actually two terms, uh, two terms here. One is, you know, the inverse of the big matrix here. Essentially, you need to compute the uh, x transpose x plus some <clears throat> plus some uh, scaled identity matrix and then invert it. And second, you need to compute the uh, inner product between x and y. Okay, so this is a uh, linear regression. So I guess maybe I can uh, pause a bit to see whether you have questions on linear regression. So far, so good as far as the YouTube chats go. So I think you can can keep going. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I hope I hope you know uh, the uh, procedure is clear. Um, I mean, you can work out the uh, uh, solution later. But essentially, the idea is you just uh, you know to construct a linear regression model, put some prior on the parameters, and then you work out the uh, loss function using map solution, which gives you the reconstruction error plus some regression term, and then you work out the best solution by zeroing the gradient. So as simple as that. Okay. So now we've talked about linear regression, right? But we definitely know that in real world, uh, the data dependencies, they are definitely non-linear. So that means we want to go beyond linear regression. And uh, one uh, way that has been um, you know, around for quite some time is to say, OK, can we use, for example, say non-linear features to perform non-linear regression? So here, the idea is that instead of computing x transpose theta as your prediction, we can say, OK, we have a predefined set of um, um, features, phi x, and then we do linear regression in the phi x space rather than in x space. And if this phi x uh, feature is complex enough, for example, say it contains quadratic terms, cubic terms, or even uh, say a polynomial terms to the to the power of um, p, or even larger other terms, non non polynomial terms. Then uh, essentially, you can make uh, you know these um, basis function uh, or the feature function are very very flexible, so that uh, the model can also be very flexible. Okay, yeah. So just to summarize the idea of nonlinear regression. The key idea, as I said, is to use a nonlinear feature mapping. And you can basically see that the only difference of uh, the uh, between this nonlinear regression model and the previous linear regression one is the use of this nonlinear feature. If you just set this nonlinear feature to uh, uh, identity, then essentially it goes back to a uh, linear mapping. And on the right hand side uh, figure, this is just a simple example to show that if you set the uh, feature, nonlinear feature to include both, say, the constant and the, and the linear and also the quadratic terms, then you can essentially you know, fit the coefficient for each of these terms that is inside theta and then uh, re do regression on this data set. OK, so now let's see when we have these nonlinear regression models, how do we actually uh, compute the optimal solution for theta? So again, as I said, uh, you can use map again the same equation as before, but now because you have changed your model, right? Your model is no, no longer linear before, then this means your uh, the actual loss function coming for this term is different. So going back to the previous slide, we know that the likelihood term is uh, Gaussian, but with mean changed by the, uh, uh, the inner product between features and also the uh, parameters. So this tells you that if you can collect all of the features for each data point into a big matrix phi, and then you know work out the uh, uh, math as before, essentially what you are doing here is you are doing a linear regression again, but 
the input here is no longer the original input x. Instead, it is the uh, in, it is the output of the feature mappings. Okay, as I said, the feature mappings is pretty fine. Like in the previous case, you use linear or quadratic functions, so that means the phi has nothing to do with the theta. So essentially, you can repeat the same trick again to to first zero out the gradient of the loss function with respect to theta, and then you get the optimal solution of uh, theta star. And you can see this is pretty much the same as uh, before, except that now the input here is no longer x. It is actually the feature vectors collected from all the input data. OK, so um, that's nonlinear regression. I hope this is uh, clear, as I said again. Uh, you just you know do linear regression, but uh, in the uh, output space of the five feature mapping. Now, so um, let's talk about um, how does the, uh, these things uh, relate to uh, GPs. So we let's take a, one step back to look at the nonlinear regression model again. As I said, you have a prior distribution as a Gaussian. Um, um, distribution on the parameter theta, and then you have the light return as a Gaussian distribution with mean as the inner product of theta and the features, and then some uh, variance. OK. So yeah, it is equivalent to linear regression with the input space defined by phi. But there are some um, um, problems or issues that uh, you may want to think about. So first, you can basically see that now, um, in order to define this likelihood term, you actually need to define the inner product between uh, phi x and theta. So this is not a problem if you say your phi um, mapping is a mapping to some, um, say, p-dimensional uh, um, space, and p is smaller than infinity. So in that case, you can still use the inner product induced by the Euclidean by the Euclidean metric to compute the inner product. However, what if you want to use a feature mapping that has infinite dimensions, right? So it's so it's it's hard to define like Euclidean uh, matrix in the infinite dimensional space. And uh, and another idea is what if you actually want this output of the phi uh, vector to not even in RP, not even in kind of like the real number spaces. Or, in, or in, instead, in some sort of complex number, or even in some very abstract space, right? So um, essentially, so uh, this that uh, requirement of defining the inner product put in, in some challenges for generalizing um, this nonlinear regression um, to some more, say, general cases. So the solution, as indicated here in the title of the kernel trick is essentially, instead of working uh, in the feature space and uh, fit the um, parameter theta, we want to directly in define the inner product and then use the inner product um, to compute all the predictions we want. So that is the idea of kernel, of kernel methods. And let's see how it is done. OK, so now, you know, we have fitted a um, um, the parameter theta star, and and then and then we are interested in you know doing predictions with the fitted parameters. So this means let's say we have some new input locations x one star to x m star, and then uh, uh, with their uh, corresponding features collected in this uh, matrix uh, phi hat. So using this um, linear regression model on in the phi space. This means prediction is computed by, you know, say, multiplying the phi hat a matrix and theta star together. And if we plug in the um, definition of the um, optimal solution, then this is essentially the solution. OK, so now let's do some tricks to uh, rewrite this equation. So first, we should uh, notice uh, the following identities. So, if you look at uh, from the right from the left hand side, uh, the product between the red matrix and uh, phi uh, transpose, you can expand this term and then you know group uh, group the term together to achieve the uh, right hand side uh, expression. Okay, I hope you can see these two things are, are equal. Then 
if we multiply, if we left multiply uh, the inverse of the red term on these two uh, sides, and also let right multiply the inverse of the uh, blue term, also on both sides, then essentially what we've got is, you know, the uh, you can see that the red term here, basically the inverse of a some of some big matrix times of my uh, transpose is equal to the um phi transpose times some other inverse matrix. Okay, we will discuss this uh, how uh, how to understand these things later, but uh, just bear with me. So now this also means that um if you left multiply phi hat and also right multiply y, then essentially what you've got here is, so here this is the uh, prediction formula that you will get if you first compute the optimal solution of a uh, phi star and then use that to compute the uh, prediction at, new, at new, loca new locations, okay? But this prediction also has another expression here. And you can see this is the, this is dependent on some uh, some other inverse matrix and some other uh, matrix product times y. Okay, um, just to rewrite it down a little bit more, I can also you know move the uh, lambda term here outside. So this is basically just to move the lambda inverse term outside, and this means you also need to put in a lambda inverse term outside here. So. I mean, the direction details are not important, but what I'm trying to say here is, uh, uh, we are trying to, what we are trying to do here is we are trying to rewrite the uh, prediction formula for this parametric model, where you plug in the optimal solution of the theta to do prediction in, uh, we, uh, into some other formula. And we will see how this formula is related to the kernel methods. So yes, as I said, these two are equivalent. This is the first formula is the parametric regression uh, prediction formula. And the second one is the prediction formula from kernel regression. So let's see uh, uh, the advantage of the kernel regression method. So remember, um, this uh, phi is a collection of, um, say, uh, feature vectors for each of the training data input. And this is a matrix of M by P and P is the dimension of the uh, feature uh, vector. So this means phi transpose phi is a P by P matrix. And this and inverting this matrix, so this matrix is P by P, inverting this matrix with say, uh, Cholesky uh, decomposition based methods uh, requires like uh, P cube time. So this can be quite expensive if you want to use, for example, say uh, thousands of dimensions or even you know, like in infinite dimension case, you can you cannot even compute it. But as I said, these two view are equivalent. And you can see in this kernel regression view, what you need to compute is this phi phi transpose matrix. And this is actually a n by n matrix. So this means the blue matrix here is also n by n. And inverting this matrix, only requires n uh, cube time. I should say again that here n is number of data points in your training data, and p is the dimensionality of your um, feature vector uh, mapping phi. So this basically means um, if you want to use uh, nonlinear features of very, very high dimensions, then doing things in the kernel uh, regression uh, way will be much more efficient comparing to doing things in the parametric regression way. Okay, so the second observation is that, you know, in this kernel regression case, what we need is the um, product of phi phi transpose, as well as the product of say the new uh, data, test data point features and the uh, uh, training data point features transpose. So this really means if you have ways to compute the, um, say the blue matrix and the uh, green matrix directly, there is no need to explicitly define phi, this phi function. 
So this is very, very useful if you want to, for example, say use infinite dimension uh, features because you know it's, it's, it, it, it is just impossible for you to uh, you know, explicitly uh, write down um, very carefully kind of like each element inside an infinite dimensional vector. But if you can just write down the, the, inner, pro uh, the inner product here, this is defined by a uh, kernel matrix. Then if you can write down it directly, then you don't actually need to define, explicitly define this file mapping. And you can directly use this kernel regression view to um, um, perform regression and do prediction here. Well, definitely, you no. Know, people also argue like advantage of the parametric regression view as well, the first one. So I should also say something about it. So um, first, if you have some domain knowledge, or prior knowledge on how to uh, how to design this phi function. For example, you know uh, your uh, um, ground truth function is polynomial. Then you should definitely uh, use say polynomial uh, features to construct phi. So in, if you know this, this will be an advantage for the parametric regression case. And also, since you can since you actually define these phi uh, features be, uh, uh, before you actually fit the theta parameters then you understand what kind of feature you are going to use in your model. So this will be better for the uh, sake of interpretability. And especially, you know, because, you know, uh, the uh, non-linear regression in this parametric view is essentially doing linear regression or linear combination between, say, feature functions, then, yeah, essentially, you know, the behavior of the fitted function in the function space. Okay, so I guess I can also uh, stop again uh, to uh, answer the questions. Okay, great. We, two questions arrived. Uh, the first question is the following. Is this kernel trip something like introducing a Riemannian metric in an appropriate space, perhaps to deal with flat geometry? Um... I'm, I'm okay. I'm not going to say uh, about like how do you actually design kernels to uh, deal, deal with geometry, but yes. So when you actually introduce this kernel or say uh, introduce how you do in inner product, essentially you are defining the inner product and also and also the metric in the uh, output space of phi. So this means if you use different kernel, then the uh, say the uh, metric space of the corresponding phi output will be different. Okay, and the other question that arrives here is the following. Can you provide an example of being able to compute the inner product of an infinity space uh, range function pi, phi, sorry. Yes, Fast. so um, you will see in the, I, I think this is also related to the, uh, the content at the end of the talk, but there are some kernel functions like say a square exponential kernel in which the corresponding phi is actually infinite dimensional. It is actually like a collection of sine waves and cosine waves. So um, in that case, phi is actually infinite dimensional. Okay, great. So that's all I have for now. You can keep going. Okay, great. So yes, so now let's, uh, um, I think the next part is really, we are trying to go from this parametric model to GPs. So um, um, bear with me, uh, definitely ask me questions. So as I said, you know, uh, people argue for uh, doing parametric regression uh, partly because it is easy to understand, like uh, for the function's viewpoint, what is the behavior of the function. But I would say that you know, uh, if you uh, also go into the field of GPs, then and then you know, start from learn things from there, you can also understand the behavior of GP in terms of function space view. So um, that might not say warrant the uh, uh, the say the function space view as the uh, say, the advantage of parametric regression only. OK, so yes, so let's see how we can actually, you know, uh, go from, say, parametric models uh, to into a function space view uh, of this model. OK, so recall we have the parametric nonlinear regression model uh, as before. We have uh, Gaussian prior and the Gaussian likelihood with mean as the inner product be uh, between the uh, um, the feature vectors and also the um, parameter theta. Okay, so now let's try to transform the prior in parameter space into a prior in function space. 
Okay, so recall that we define a, fun a, a predicted function as like the inner product between the feature and also the uh, parameter theta. And also here, phi, this feature is a fixed uh, mapping. So it has nothing, it has no randomness. It has nothing to do with um, theta. So now for any n, essentially for any collection of input data points, x1 to xn, you can actually compute the function value output for each of them, right? And then collect all of them to construct a vector. So this is essentially at, uh, computed as uh, uh, phi times uh, theta. So now, as I said, you know, phi is a constant with respect to theta, and we know that uh, theta is Gaussianly distributed. So this also means f is Gaussian distributed. Okay, so I think this trick is uh, this is very important to understand. So let me say that again. So phi is a um, phi is constant with respect to theta. So it has no randomness. It has uh, it is uh, not correlated uh, with theta. So that means if you condition on the input x, which means uh, you also condition on the uh, feature phi, and then do a linear transform for the Gaussian variables it will result in another Gaussian variable with uh, mean zero because you have um, zero mean for uh, theta, but the variance here will change, right? So this is basically just you know, uh, use the uh, uh, the way you compute, uh, say, lin uh, linear transformation of Gaussian variables, and this gives you the uh, covariance matrix of this um, um, Gaussian distribution. One, one little thing to notice here is that, you know, um, because, you know, theta is shared across all data inputs x1 and xn when we compute f. So this means the, uh, the function values f, xi, and f, xj are actually correlated. And you can see their uh, covariance is defined by the i and by the ij entry to this kernel matrix. Okay. So I hope uh, that this is an important step. So if you don't understand, you can come back and ask questions. So now, um, the like for the likelihood term, we know that first we have this IID assumption on condition on the input and the uh, parameters, and this is basically our definition with Gaussians. And we know that we have defined the function as the inner product between feature vectors and the and the parameters. Then it is just you can basically just change the uh, notation here by writing the uh, conditional distribution as the uh, P of Y condition on the function values. And this is still a Gaussian because this is a distribution on Y and you've just rewrite uh, this uh, mean using F. Okay, so now we have, you know, changed from the parameter space view to function space view. And this gives you a uh, equivalent notation of the model of the uh, of, of the parameter model, but now we are actually running things in a function space view. Okay, so if you are happy with this, also notice that this function space view applies to any n that is greater than zero. Okay, so this is so this is important to understand how we can extend these things to prediction. So just to repeat uh, this uh, w the way to write this again, assume we are going to have n training inputs and m test inputs. Okay, it, then we can basically, you know, say uh, compute their corresponding features phi and phi hat, and then concatenate them together into it to be a long matrix, and then we can use it to compute the uh, say the function prediction for the on the training data that is shown in blue, and also the prediction on the uh, test data is shown uh, in green. Okay, we are doing basically the same thing as before. So yeah, now you see uh, um, f is a linear f. F and F hat is a linear transformation of uh, the uh, random variable theta, and theta is Gaussianly distributed. So this also tells you condition on the input, uh, the training and test input S and F hat. Um, the um, pretty the output value on training data and test data they are jointly Gaussian with zero mean because you have uh, mean zero for theta. But then the uh, variance is you need to compute the, uh, say, the uh, um, 
yeah, you need to come. You need to compute the outer products of these vectors and and its transpose. So that gives you four terms. So the first term is the the term we see before. They see the correlation. Uh, sorry, the, the covariance matrix on the training data, and. Uh, this term is the covariance matrix on the test data. And these two terms, they are the uh, covariance between the training data and the test data. Okay. So, yeah, just as I said, the, the, the thing to do this, is, the uh, thing we are doing here is essentially we write down both the training data and test data predictions and then basically just, you know, uh, uh, write down, uh, you know, push the um, parameter space Gaussian distribution into a function space Gaussian distribution as well. Okay, so now we have the prior and let's see the likelihood term. So again, as said, we basically use say a uh, linear um, transfer, linear model in the um, phi space, and then we assume we have a Gaussian noise. So this essentially gives you like the likelihood terms or the, condition, or the conditional distribution of y given f. And similarly, it also gives you the likelihood terms on the uh, test data. One important thing to notice here is that here we assume independent noise. So uh, the uh, noise for test data epsilon hat is independent with the noise on training data epsilon. Okay, so this also tells you that if you write down the joint dis uh, distribution of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the y output given the function predictions, then they are factorized; they are independent. Okay, so combining uh, combine all both observations together, now we've got a function space view of the nonlinear regression model. Model, but now it includes both the training data point and the test data point. So it tells you that you have a likelihood term for uh, uh, the training and test data point, and they are factorized. And then you have a uh, prior distribution uh, over the functions on both training data and the test data, and they are jointly Gaussian. Okay, so now let's see how to do um, prediction on this data on this case. So one thing, one very nice uh, thing to notice is that uh, for, uh, for a joint Gaussian, you can basically write down it, uh, its factorized um, way into say um, uh, P of F giving S and also another conditional distribution. And importantly, this conditional distribution uh, of F hat given uh, the uh, training uh, inputs, test input, and also the training predictions, this is also a Gaussian distribution. So that means if you know how to compute you know, this Gaussian, then you definitely know how to compute this Gaussian. So now, prediction with this function space model can be done in two ways. One is essentially you, you get the map solution for the uh, model, sorry, for, for the uh, uh, function output on training data. And then you plug in this map solution for the function output of, of the training data into this conditional Gaussian, and then you can essentially sample um, the Gaussian predictions for your test data. So this is how, what I call it map because you are actually using a point estimate on the uh, training data uh, uh, training, uh, for the, the output on the training data. But you know, uh, in the Gaussian process literature. People actually do full Bayesian treatment, which means they want to consider every possible uh, output for this um, F on training data. So this means if you can, if you want to do a Gaussian process regression in a full Bayesian way, then essentially you are going to sample from this uh, post posterior distribution, where it is defined by first this um, conditional Gaussian distribution that that comes from prior, and then the posterior distribution of the function values evaluated on the training data. And this one is just you know, proportional to uh, the uh, product of prior on training data and the likelihood on training data. So this is just base rule. So this is Gaussian process regression. We, have, we finally arrived to Gaussian process regression. So just to summarize the idea, the idea here is um, you are going to uh, do this uh, linear, multiplication phi times x, sorry, phi times theta in order to push the Gaussian on theta to a Gaussian on f. So this is the whole idea. You just need to work out the corresponding Gaussian, then that's done. 
Okay, so we've talked about uh, Gaussian process. Uh, okay, maybe I, I can also stop here uh, to uh, answer questions. Okay, it doesn't seem that any questions have arrived. So I think you can keep going if anything pops up, I, I tell yes, you. Yes, okay, great. So uh, let's now talk a little bit about this Gaussian process regression. So uh, this is just some textbook definition. So uh, essentially, uh, because uh, you know, I just said that you know this sort of that function space will applies to any n, any collection of data points. So this basically means that uh, a Gaussian process is a collection of random variables that is indexed by you know the input locations, where you know if you take any subset from these uh, say uh, variables, basically with cardinality, with cardinality n, then they are jointly Gaussian, and the covariance matrix is defined by a kernel function. No, a kernel function basically just help you to compute the elements inside this covariance matrix. You can definitely have non-zero mean for this Gaussian, but uh, with, uh, in this talk, I'm just going to assume that your GP has a zero mean function, just to simplify uh, the uh, understanding. Okay, just to repeat again, um, if you're going to do a GP regression, there are just uh, uh, two uh, components you, you need to specify. You need to specify a GP prior, and in particular, you need to specify a kernel function. So that tells you how to compute the elements inside the uh, covariance matrix for the Gaussian. And also, you need to uh, specify an observation model, uh, essentially how are you going to compute the uh, output y given the function values. And usually in GPs, we just assume it is Gaussian because uh, this will give you an say analytic solutions for uh, all these um, inference um, below. So to do predictions, so first you need to uh, get some training data and then for prediction, you need to compute the posterior distribution of the function output on the test data. And this is the posterior. And as I said, again, you just this is the uh, equation you need to compute and, you know, um, uh, don't worry about the details for, for now, but ju just to say that all of these terms, they are Gaussian, so there is a, a, an analytic form to compute it. So now let's try to understand a little bit more about GPs. So um, essentially, how do, do we actually going to plot a function sample for the GP, right? Because, you know, a, a GP is defined as a, a collection of intimate number of random variables. So, you know, it's hard to actually plot a, a, a object of even dimensions. But so usually um, uh, the way we plot GPs is something like this. We first define the locations that we want to evaluate the function, like as hat, and usually we use a grid. This is very efficient if you say your input x is only one dimensional or say two dimensional or three dimensional. So that will be easy for you to plot. And then, so once you fix a grid, this means you already fixed a finite number of input locations. So, and this means you can compute the kernel matrix here, right? With each element as say, evaluating the kernel uh, with input x and x j star. So now you've computed the uh, covariance matrix, then you can actually sample from this Gaussian. So sampling from Gaussian is easy. You just need to compute the uh, Cholesky differentiation of this matrix, and then you sample a Gaussian noise, and then you, multi you uh, multiply this Gaussian noise with the uh, decomposition of uh, this kind of matrix. So you can do it. OK, so um, this is the way you, you get uh, prior samples. And once you've got these uh, samples at hat, you can actually plot it um, by saying x is the location of your input and y, you just need to plot the, uh, put the corresponding function value samples uh, for uh, in the corresponding location. So you can basically see here in the prior, each uh, function in different color is one function sample from the GP. And you can, I mean, it is it is smooth that you might think this is uh, some sort of continuous, but actually when you, when you plot it, you actually use a very fine grid and basically just plot the corresponding function value there. And this will look very smooth. Posterior sample is also the same. So as I said before, if you do GP regression, this term is also a Gaussian. And uh, we know how to sample for a Gaussian given a grid. So there you have it. We have plot the posterior samples. Uh, and here again, say uh, each function in different color is uh, a sam function sample from the posterior. And especially because we know that this is a Gaussian, then we know the mean of this, we, then we can compute the mean of this function 
sorry, well, the mean of this distribution and also the variance of this function. And this will actually help you to plot this kind of like predictive distribution with mean function in blue and also this shady area as I believe maybe this is like um, um, three sigma uh, um, re, um, um, bands for the uh, marginal variance. So essentially, if you have this predictive distribution, then you can plot this. Okay, so this is how you're going to plot the uh, GP uh, uh, regression uh, results of both plotting the plier and the uh, posterior distribution. So um, before we go into the topics about say neural networks and uh, GP, so let's uh, talk a little bit about constructing kernels. So what is a kernel function? So um, I'm going to skip the, uh, say, uh, very technical and uh, mathy definitions, but essentially, if you go back to the previous example of nonlinear regression, essentially, kernel, uh, in that case, you just need to define, uh, compute the inner product between the uh, feature vectors from different input. So this is the kernel function in the previous nonlinear regression example. Also, as I said, you know, you can also define the kernel function directly, and this will allow you to, for example, use infinite dimensional features. So then if you define the kernel, then there are just you know, three uh, things that you need to satisfy because uh, you need to make sure this is not uh, uh, negative and also uh, it is um, um, symmetric and also it is uh, positive, the same definite. Okay, so now let's see how these kernels look like. Okay, so um, there are some, uh, um, um, you know, often used kernels as uh, shown here. So the square exponential kernel is the one that I, uh, I discussed briefly uh, when I answered one of the questions and uh, this kernel uh, looks like this and the corresponding functions from, from the GP with this kernel looks something like this. So you can also define some other kernels like periodic kernel and the corresponding function has some sort of periodic behavior. And you know, in the previous case, if we say, oh, we just want to do linear regression, then the uh, corresponding kernel is a linear kernel. You can see as a linear function and the uh, function samples from the GP with linear kernel is essentially linear functions. Okay, so that means if you actually define the kernels by, for example, first constructing the um, feature vectors phi and then do inner products, then I think uh, understanding GPs is as easy as understanding the parametric regression case. But you know, for some other kernels like this square exponential kernel, uh, uh, because their dimension, uh, their feature dimension is actually infinity. So it might be hard to actually understand what they're actually doing. So um, just to talk a little bit about this. So, um, the uh, square, exponential, square exponential kernel is something like this that looks like a Gaussian again, but uh, this is the kernel. Um, so to understand this, first we notice that uh, we can compute the correlation between say two function outputs by normalizing their covariance matrix with uh, their, their marginal variance. And we know that, you know, uh, if two, uh, Random variables, they are positively and highly correlated, then they are likely to have very similar values. So this is important to note. And here, because you know, for square exponential for square exponential kernel, the variance is essentially computing kx and x. So it is constant. Okay, for any x, i and xj. And we have the covariance as uh, the kernel uh, um, evaluated on x, i and xj. So this essentially tells you that the covariance of the uh, two function values, if you use a GP with square exponential kernel is something like this. And this has a very nice interpretation. If you have the, uh, the, the L2 distance between two inputs to be small, well, definitely divided by L is small, then essentially um, this correlation is very close to one. So that means these two values are highly correlated, which means f, x, i, and f, s, j are like, likely to have similar values. Okay, and then if you increase L, right? When you increase L, this term becomes smaller. Then it, this, it means that the correlation becomes higher. And then, you know, even it, the correlation becomes higher even for data points that are reasonably apart from each other. 
So that means your function will become smoother. So this is definitely visualized in these uh, examples. So in this case, for example, uh, these are uh, uh, the prior uh, samples from the GP uh, with the kernel that uh, with the square exponential kernel with these parameters. So now we have one over uh, four as the length scale, or basically L parameters here. If we increase the length scale to some large number, then you can basically see this is actually a uh, very smooth function compared to a previous case, a uh, pretty uh, 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 weakly function. Okay, so uh, if you make it, um, you know, decently large but not too large, then yeah, it is uh, it is smooth, but maybe not that smooth comparing to this, uh, say, a uh, very uh, high length scale case. Also, the sigma uh, here is essentially controlling the magnitude of the kernel, then essentially it's controlling the magnitude of the covariance matrix. So if you increase the sigma uh, um, uh, f here, then you can basically see, yes, the behavior is still the same, but you notice a change in the y-axis. OK, so um, that's essentially at least how you can understand the behavior of functions uh, from a um, kernel, say the square exponential kernel that has uh, infinite dimensional features. So um, I will stop here to um, say uh, get some questions from you before I continue on to the uh, neural level part. Okay, so one question arrived. Uh, it goes like in plot in the plot of slide nineteen, variance of prior is higher than the posterior. Can you please explain? Okay, right, yes. So the whole idea of doing a uh, GP regression is that you want to be able to reduce uncertainty on the on the point you've seen, right? So it, maybe it, this is not very uh, easily seen, but you can basically see uh, there are some black dots here that correspond to the observed data. So you can basically see that, okay, so if you have observed data, then there is no uncertainty there, right? So that explains why you have something, all the functions are uh, going across here and the variance at this point is zero. So that's the first point. And second, as I discussed, the way you define kernel functions, you know, is for example, you use square exponential kernel, tells you the, the similarity or the correlation between function values depending on the distance of your input. So that basically means, you know, for the other point that is for the input location that is actually close to this input data point, you kind of expect that uh, the function values are similar to the observed one. So that explains why you have say smaller variance here. So as soon as you go further up away from the observed data point, then the uh, correlation becomes smaller, then it is, unlike, it is less likely for the function values to be similar to the observed data. And that explains why you have, say, higher uh, variance here. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, that, that, was, that was it for now. We can, can keep going. Thank you. OK, great. So. Um, so that's all kind of the setup for linear regression, uh, nonlinear regression, kernel methods, and GP. So now let's go to neural networks. So, you know, we do nonlinear regression. And, you know, uh, in this case, we actually need to have a predefined nonlinear feature map, which might be, might be the case if you have some prior knowledge. But now we are in the area of deep learning. And people say, OK, we want to learn the uh, feature maps as well. Right, so this is very useful uh, when the real world data is uh, is complex and you don't have very good intuition on that. Okay, so um, just to say the deep learning solution, a very simple solution is to build a one hidden layer neural network that looks like this. You have some hidden units uh, and these connected with the input and also connected with the output. And uh, here you will have the parameters uh, as the uh, input weight, uh, as the first layer weights and biases and the second layer weights. So you can also have the bias term there, but um, just for the sake of simplicity, I just ignore that. Okay, so if a side here is a nonlinear activation function. For example, people might want to use say sigmoid or ReLU. And um, if we, in this case, learn the uh, first layer weights parameters and bias parameters here, then we are essentially learning the nonlinear features. 
and each of the nonlinear features is represented by one unit. Okay, so now let's see how do we actually initialize the neural network because you need to initialize the neural network before you actually train the neural network, right? So usually, you know, if you look at, for example, say the packages on PyTorch or TensorFlow, there are a bunch of um, uh, ways to do that, but they are more or less similar. For example, uh, a typical solution is to initialize the uh, weights with what is called her initialization. So the idea is to uh, sample each of the connection here, connection weights here, from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and some variance. Okay, you can also initialize the uh, bias with zero or using some Gaussian samples as well. And you, you do the same Gaussian sampling for the second layer weights. So that's usually how people initialize neural networks. The one important thing to notice here is that um, we initialize each of the connections independently. So this basically means um, we are getting a sample of the parameters theta for a prior distribution. And this prior distribution is a factorized distribution. So you can basically see that the first layer weights are independent with the, uh, say, the biases and also independent with the second layer weight. So one interesting question that you can ask is, you know, after you initialize this distribution, these uh, neural network weights, how would the corresponding function output looks like for this randomly initialized network? And to understand this, this will give you the connection between why the neural networks and Gaussian processes. And I think this is the topic for uh, the uh, Friday's uh, um, invited talk that you might be interested in listening. Okay, to understand this, let's, uh, uh, we need a, uh, say, STAT 101 theorem that is called essential limit theorem. Essentially, it just tells you that um, if you want to estimate the mean of a distribution using um, sample mean, and central limit theorem tells you that, you know, when you have infinite amount of samples, then the sample mean is, rough, is roughly Gaussianly distributed with the mean uh, and variance defined by the underlying distribution that you are sampled from. Okay, so that's the STAT 101 uh, um, theorem that we are, and we are going to use that to understand uh, the connections between randomized, randomly initialized neural networks and Gaussian processes. Okay, so remember that we are saying that we're going to initialize the parameters independently from the same prior. So this basically means you know, like uh, the uh, connection weights here in red, they are sampled from the same distribution as the prior of the connection weights in here in um, green, and they are sampled in an independent way. So that's explained by ID. Okay, so this basically means given a fixed input X, um, the, out, the hidden uh, units, there are also IID samples, but from some in the implicitly defined distribution. So the form of this, this distribution uh, doesn't matter. But the important thing is to notice that these are uh, these are uh, HI and HJ are IID samples condition on X. Just to repeat again, because you know in this expression X is fixed. The only uh, variable that is ran that are random are the uh, weights and the biases. And as I said, you know, these are uh, green weights and the red weights, they are independently sampled from the same distribution. So that basically means first, these two units are independent, and second, they are they come from the same distribution. Okay. Similarly, we can do uh these uh, kind of in the this kind of uh, uh, variations again. We, uh, we also said that, you know, the second layer weights, they are also IID sample, which means, you know, these outputs are connection weights in red. It's independent with the connection weights here in uh, green, and um, they all come from the same distribution. Okay, so this means, you know, we already know that HI and HJ are independent and uh, identically distributed. Also, VI and VJ, they are IID. So that means they are products, they are also IID. So in summary, the, in, the incoming inputs to the final unit here in red is independent 
with these uh, incoming contribution uh, from the uh, green path, and they come from the same distribution. This is important. This is important to notice. So you can also apply these things for other connections as well. And now finally realize that by taking the sum here, f is a sum of iid random variables. We are very close to the DCLD. So now um, let's figure out um, what is the distribution of uh, this f. So we now let's assume that we have some distribution, uh, some prior on the uh, output weight v, and assume it has zero mean and some variance. And importantly, this variance is sc scales inversely uh, with m, the number of hidden units. So this is important because we are going to apply uh, a CLT. So let's compute the expectation and also the variance of the function using this assumption. So first, um, it is easy to it is easy to see that the expectation of f is zero, basically because first v uh, i is independent with f with h i, so you can basically uh, factorize out, and then v i uh, has mean zero. Okay, so th that means this function uh, has mean zero. So now let's see the variance. So to compute the variance, first you want to compute the uh, variance of this whole term. And if you use the fact that the contribution to the outputs are independent, then it goes back to the sum of variances. And then you notice that you know the second layer's weight is independent with the first layer. Then the second uh, layer weight is independent with the uh, 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 the hidden units. Then it will basically gives you the uh, uh, variance of uh, v, which is sigma v square divided by m, and then the very and then the aspect, the second moment of h m. I should also say that h um. Okay, so um. Right. Okay. So the um. There, there is a slight mistake here. Depend, depending on the uh, activation function you use, the uh, second uh, moment of the uh, uh, hidden units might not be the equal to variance. Variance, but what the the point here is that um, if you make m goes to infinity, right? And remember that uh, these hidden units they are iid are independently and identically distributed then essentially you can apply the law of large numbers to conclude that this will converge to some value. And large, uh, large, the law of large numbers is essentially just, you know, uh, 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 the, uh, in some sense, the cousin of uh, the CLT. So that basically means if you apply CLT in this case and make M go to infinity, then you can get a, um, this function value given the input x as scales and distributed with mean zero and some variance. Okay, so that's for one input. And you can actually extend this um, idea to compute the covariance between, say, the function values of the two different inputs. So you apply the same analysis again by noticing like lot of independence uh, structure, you know, uh, the independence between the output weights and the hidden units and the independence between the hidden units. So essentially you can apply similar ideas again to notice that when you make M goes to infinity with the CLT um, um, argument, the joint distribution of two um, function output on different input values is also Gaussian distribution with the uh, covariance computed using some formula and you can actually use this formula to come to construct a kernel distribution to construct a kernel function notice that this is true for any input x and x prime so this basically means um, f is a sample from a GP. Let me repeat this again. The idea here is essentially what you are, what you are trying to do 
is to notice the independent structure between the uh, inputs weights and the output weights, and also between the hidden units. And then apply CLT when you make the number of hidden units goes to infinity to get the uh, corresponding, say, uh, distribution for the output val values. This essentially says that if you initialize um, your neural network weights uh, in the, um, randomly and make, like, say, each of the hidden units independent, and also uh, different layers independent to with each other. Essentially, you are sampling a function from a Gaussian process with the kernel defined by the neural network architecture. I hope this is clear. And this is essentially you know, many th uh, proved in uh, Rafa Neal's uh, thesis. I think that's back in the 90s. And people have extended these results into like a deep neural networks. So previously, I explained this result for one hidden layer, and uh, now this result has uh, has also been extended for say multiple layers. So this is true for deep uh, neural networks as well, and also this is true for convolutional neural networks because convolutional neural networks is just a specific way to tile weights, and you can also make the number of um, yeah, the, the number the, the number of um, um, channels, the number of channels in the convolutional neural network who goes to um, infinity, and that will also gives you a Gaussian process, but with some interesting kernel defined by uh, the convolutional neural network structure. Okay, so um, let's uh, pause here and see whether if you have any questions. Okay, so there's a question that arrived a while ago. Mm -hmm. as the following uh, correlation measures uh, if two random variables have relationships close to linears. However, correlation close to one might mean that the two random variables are far apart, very high, sl very high slope. Mm -hmm. uh, how does Gaussian processes solve this issue? It depends on whether this is positive only or, or negatively related, right? So uh, if you, for example, you look at uh, the kernel, uh, kernel, I mean, I mean, if you, I mean, if you use square exponential kernel, then essentially uh, it is hard to, uh, well, depends on how you actually choose the um, length scale. So you can basically see in this case, the length scales, right? Uh, uh, when you change the length scales, the uh, smoothness changes. So you could imagine in this case, you can use e an even smaller L. Let's say this is very close to zero. Then essentially it means that in order to make this uh, kernel to be uh, large, you need to make sure that X and X prime are very, very close to each other. So that basically means it, when you have very small length scales that is close to zero, even if the two inputs are slightly further apart, this kernel will be very, very close to zero. So essentially, it will, re it will go back to, say, random noise. Because you know, uh, uh, if correlation is zero, then uh, they, are, they are independent. They are, oh, sorry, they are, they are uncorrelated. So um, yeah, I, I would say that you can basically change the length scales to uh, get some sort of spiky functions um, from here. And also, if you use some other kernels, like, say, a periodic kernel, um, and also use some other length scales and also maybe use some sort of other uh, uh, um, parameters in the periodic kernel, then you will also see some other uh, um, patterns in terms of like making uh, the two variables negatively correlated. I see. Thank you. Um, that, that's all for now. Okay, good. So, um, yeah. Okay, let me quick, very, very quickly go through the other one. Uh, so we just di discussed the connections between neural networks and also uh, getting processes in, in that if you randomly initialize the neural network and then made the neural network super wide, essentially you are sampling functions from the GP. Okay, so now you can, there is another, also another connection between GPs and uh, neural networks. So essentially the idea here is uh, you can actually use a neural network to approximate a GP inference. So why do you want to do that? So um, you don't need to remember this equation. What I'm trying to show here is that if you're going to do predictive inference with GP, 
by uh, sampling from the conditional distribution, sorry, from the positive distribution of the uh, of f hat uh, given data and the uh, test input, what you need to do is you need to invert this matrix. And the KSX matrix is M I N. So this means if you have a large number of data points, like um, 10,000 or something like that, um, the N you cannot afford this N cube cost. So this is essentially one of the biggest problems uh, for GP uh, inference implemented in practice, and people have tried a lot of approximation methods. So uh, one of the approximation methods is actually related to neural networks. To see this, let's get to another, maybe real analysis 101 uh, um, um, theorem. That tells you that you know um, you can all you can represent a um, function, a continuous function, as say sum of sine waves with um, different empty amplitude and different period and different uh, shape, something like that. Okay. So yeah, so this is just a uh, visualization. So this is your function. Uh, this, this this is your function, and you can decompose it into different uh um. Uh, different sine waves, and also tell uh, the um, um, tell people say uh, how much contribution comes from say uh, this sine wave and how much contribution comes from other sine waves. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, Fourier inverse transform theorem. So there is also something um, related um, similar for kernel methods as well. So uh, this is just the simplest form of the Bogner's uh, theorem. So it basically says that if you have a, a translation invariant kernel, which means uh, uh, the kernel uh, evaluation depends on the difference between uh, two inputs, then this kernel can be represented using a uh, Fourier inverse transform. To see how uh, to see more in detail, so let's assume this is a um, real value kernel. So this basically means you know only the cosine waves contribute because the sine waves will be the imaginary uh, uh, component which uh, you know uh, the value the, fun, the kernel value is actually real valued. So you only have the cosine uh, contributions, and also if you write down like the uh, cosine uh, of x minus x prime, you can also end up with this equation. So putting all of them together, it basically tells you that. Um, a properly scaled translation invariant kernel and real value kernel can be represented by this formula. I hope you have noticed some similarities. So let's carry on to see uh, exactly how we can uh, uh, understand this uh, understand this using neural networks. So first, you know, this representation tells you that if you want to compute the kernel matrix, you need to compute the expectation of this inside in the product. Okay, so in practice, what we can do is we do multi color approximation, which means we will first get some samples W and B from the uh, uh, distribution here, P, W, and P, B, and then compute the empirical average to approximate this uh, exact kernel function. So this is multi color approximation. Now, we are going to rewrite this multi color approximation a bit by collecting each of these cosine terms into a vector. So if you define an H vector as an M dimensional vector, where each of the M, uh, H M in, um, um, element is basically cosine of W M transpose X plus B M, then you can essentially rewrite the previous um, multi color approximation um, equation into a scaled version of inner product. I hope now you have noticed something that is very, very similar to what we've talked, what we've been talking about throughout this talk. So just to carry on, essentially this tells you that if you want to, you know, uh, very quickly sample uh, from a um, Gaussian process with some kernel here, and that in that kernel satisfy the some properties as mentioned before, then essentially you can approximate that kernel with some with some inner product computations and then sample a function from this approximating GP. Furthermore, this has a very nice connection to a single layer hidden Bayesian neural networks because sampling from a GP we know is we, we know is equivalent to 
this will, you can first, you know, sample a um, sort of like a V vector from a Gaussian distribution and then compute the inner product between V and the H vector. And the H feature vectors are computed using these cosine functions with the weights and the bias sample from the uh, prior distribution uh, PW and PV. So this is essentially how you are going to initialize a single hidden layer neural network. Although, you know, in this neural network, the activation function is not um, um, value, it is cosine function. So by doing this, we have um, concluded that you can actually, um, uh, for, for quite a certain number of kernels, you can actually get samples from the corresponding GP prior by constructing an equivalent neural network and then sample the, uh, and then randomly initialize that neural network and then use that neural network to compute the forward pass. And here, the interesting here is by adding number of components, basically increasing M, we are actually increasing the number of hidden units. So this basically means you can think about each hidden unit as a cosine component in the, um, say in the inverse uh, Fourier transformation for this kernel function. And by increasing the number of uh, units M to infinity, we are get, we, this approximation becomes a set and it also corresponds to the previous, you know, you know why the limit, why, why, why the width limit of neural networks. We've just discussed, you know, if you take the limits of the um, hidden layers to infinity, then this random initialized neural network goes to GP. And this is another, say, view in another direction that tells you that finite um, dimension neural networks with a certain way of initialization and uh, can be viewed as an approximation to a GP prior. Yeah. I don't. I th I think this thing uh, can be extended to you know lots of other things as well. You can extend this thing to deep GPs. Um, I don't think I want to discuss this uh, uh, here, but uh, many of the views can be extended uh, from say shallow GPs to deep GPs where you stack GPs together. And this is the uh, paper that you may want to look at to see how this extension is done. Essentially, if you do this sort of like say. Uh, uh, connection between deep GP, uh, from deep GP to neural networks, you are actually uh, using a deep neural network but with some bottleneck layers in between. That, so that is a very interesting result. So to summarize today's talk, so um, I hope um, I, I don't I know this is pretty dense in technical details, but I hope uh, this will help you to you know, you know get some foundations done and then uh, to uh, help you get ready on the Friday's lecture. Essentially, what we've discussed is we first start from the parametric view of linear and uh, regression, and then extend this thing to a uh, nonlinear regression. And then we use the kernel tricks to tell you how you can view these things in non-parametric way. And then we discuss, you know, how you can also view things in the function space um, um, view, and this will gives you the GP regression. So this is the connections between the parametric models and GP regression. And then we discuss in the neural network case, how does say a random insurance neural network relates to a GP in terms of either say the width limit using CLT or as a, or the random insurance neural network is a random, is a approximation to the GP prior using the theory from random feature approximations. So there is a hot topic of research on connecting, uh, say, different architecture of neural networks to GP. And I think many of the uh, uh, papers have shown that, in, at least in the prior case, many of the uh, neural network architectures uh, has its corresponding GP uh, limit. But another very interesting uh, question is to analyze whether this kind of correspondence still holds after training. Either you do this, I would say, a point estimate by doing SGD, or you do Bayesian inference by computing the, the posterior or the, or the approximate posterior. Whether these um, correspondence still holds and how accurate they hold is a active uh, topic of research. And I think uh, this will be discussed on the Friday session. Okay, thank you, I'm done. So I can answer your further questions. <laughs>
Okay, so we have some other questions that arrived here. Uh, Vikash asks us if, uh, regarding slides 30 and 31, if the results shown in newer networks uh, are true for all types of functions, or do you have some constraints? Um, well, there are some technical conditions that you need to satisfy in order to make this proof work. For example, you need this kind of say, uh, you, 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 you need some sort of bounding things for uh, this f function. So the, the technical uh, um, conditions you can find it in um, reference news thesis. Um, so what's the question again? You are, thinking, you are talking about this kind of flexibility, right? So um, I would say from my understanding, so many of the uh, say often use activation functions like sigmoids and also uh, are, are kind of say valid for this view. So um, you can also you can actually use them to get the corresponding GPs. I think value, value is also okay. So uh, you know, and also as I said, you know, this view applies not only to single layer neural network but also to deep neural network as well, and also for many other architectures. There are some architect other architectures like, you know, architecture with convolutional neural networks and uh, with, uh, say, recurrent neural networks. Um, I believe for attention, you might be able to say something else depending on how you actually, uh, you know, uh, define the number of heads or something like that. But, uh, and also how do you actually aggregate the heads? But um, there might be some also uh, some similar results there. Okay, thanks. And another question here from Fernando is, how may heterosedasticity show up in these approaches? Okay, I see. So I I didn't, so throughout this talk, I didn't talk about anything regarding to say, uh, um, you know, ho non-homogeneous noise, right? I always I always assume that the uh, variance of the output uh, uh, model, let's go back to, uh, Okay, I have too many slides. <laughs> uh, yes, we always assume that this variance is um, like um, uh, the same across all locations. It is possible to have no homogeneous no noise as well, and I think this has also been uh, discussed in uh, GP literature. I mean, you can you can, for example, either you know say uh, fit a parametric function for the output noise, or you can also put a uh, say GP prior on the uh, variant on the output noise as well. Um, although I would say that usually in GP re regression, uh, people often use like uh, homogeneous uh, noise across locations. Great. Here, what I think is the last question is more general one. Mm -hmm. is, do you have any book recommendations for someone that wants to start learning Bayesian inference? Huh, interesting. Uh, well, I would say that uh, depend. I, I think it depends on like uh, which direction you want to go, right? So if you want, say, a more machine learning uh, point kind of view, then I would say, you know, say textbooks from Chris Bishop or uh, Kevin Murphy might be uh, more appropriate. But if you want to really get into things like Bayesian statistics, that is more uh, statistical uh, point of view, then, you know, I think uh, textbooks from, for example, say, um, um, okay, I can't remember uh, his name again. So, um, Yeah, there, I, I think I think there is a uh, a textbook called Bayesian data analysis that might be helpful, and, and that is um, um, more from the statistics point of view. I think the important thing here for uh, learning Bayesian inference is essentially first understand uh, uh, what what Bayes rule is, how to do say Bayesian inference, how to do predictive inference using the Bayesian formula, and second understand the challenge of uh, Bayesian inference as uh, getting samples from the posterior, and there are an you know, quite a vast amount of, of literature in Bayesian inference is about how you actually efficiently simulate or approximate the, the uh, inside posterior. There are some other topics about how do you com uh, compare uh, models as well. How do you see that model as well? Uh, but uh, that is more on uh, related to this that side. So um, it's very specific to GPs, as I said. Um, I recommend watching videos from the GP summer school. They're okay. actually very good. <laughs>
great, great tips. Okay, so I think that that was all the questions that we have. I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. It gave like a, a starting for real regressions all the way to Bayesian neural networks, give a very nice intuition for everything that people will need to learn to get a better sense in Friday's lecture. And mm -hmm. in the name of data and the organization of this seminar series, I'd like to thank you very much for that. Yeah, thanks. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I uh, definitely uh, look forward uh, to say here uh, your future lectures. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>